Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, Aisha, Abu. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. We yes, can. Yes, Ray. Yeah, hi. Mm -hmm. so, uh, good afternoon, everybody joining us this afternoon. I hope you are keeping safe. I hope you are warm and I hope you have electricity to join us for this webinar. Uh, my mm. name is Emma Taka and I'm with the Daily Maverick. Uh, now, business owners, um, I wonder how are you coping with the lockdown uh, that is now running for four months? Um, is your business surviving during uh, a prohibition economy? Uh, and have you changed how you run your business uh, to accommodate the new normal? These are the questions I'll be exploring mm. with our uh, a really good uh, panel of experts during this webinar, which is sponsored uh, by Future Growth um, Asset Managers. So Future Growth, thank you so much for sponsoring this webinar. This afternoon, we have um, Aisha Pando. Can you just raise your hand so everybody can, can see you, Aisha? They, <laughs> there we go. Uh, she is the co-founder and CEO of Sweepsaw. And now you've probably used uh, Sweepsaw to look for a domestic worker online for your home or office. Uh, she has connected many domestic workers to uh, job opportunities. So thank you so much, Aisha, for joining us. We also yeah. have um, Abu Adaya. Hi, Abu. Hi. There you go. So he's the co-founder and CEO of Trick, uh, which is a financial uh, technology company. He works you know, a lot with uh, entrepreneurs and individuals to manage their personal finances um, as well. So we also have Amrish. Uh, he is not with us uh, for the moment, so he'll probably join us later. But um, Amrish, when he joins us, he is uh, Amrish uh, Narandes. He is an investment analyst at Future Growth. He is the money mm -hmm. guy, but um, don't ask him for money during this webinar. So um, <laughs> thank, you, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Now, there's a lot of bad news going around, and hopefully, we will leave you empowered with advice um, and information. But um, we are running a poll um, about venture capital funding. Uh, do you know what this form of uh, you know, capital funding entails? That is the question. So the poll should be somewhere in the your left or right tab, uh, somewhere there. Uh, it will pop up. So please just participate. It will help us you know, understand where we should take this conversation um, this afternoon. Uh, so Aisha, let me start with you. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, I just wonder, has COVID-19 and the lockdown been disruptive to your business and sleep sauce, and how have you adjusted or even, uh, you know, surviving during this difficult period? Oh, thanks, Ray. Yeah, I mean, so um, we've been, um, I'm majorly affected by by the pandemic. Um, I'm just, you know, looking through some of the comments on the on the chat and seeing a lot of people who are entrepreneurs say the same thing. Um, but we've been inf affected in numerous ways. So, um, you know, as you said, Sweepsout is a it's an online um, home services platform. We started with home cleaning, um, but now provide a wide range of home services and and even some home products. And um, during lockdown stage five, when it was initially announced, we weren't able to roll out our services. You know, you weren't allowed to have a domestic worker working in your home. Um, and so we were affected um, operationally, you know, in not being able to operate. But I think, um, you know, at, at various levels, this affected us. I think kind of overall uh, lockdown was announced. I think people... Um, ourselves included, there was a lot of uncertainty. We weren't really sure how long lockdown would last. I think, you know, a lot of people initially kind of thought it's three weeks and then we don't know what after then and felt quite hopeful about things kind of starting to get back to normal post that. Um, and so we had to plan for, you know, a bit of an uncertain future as the story was kind of playing out around the world. And we had to think about the impact that it would have um, both short term, potentially medium and long term, and then mm -hmm. on our business in various ways. So we had to think about the, the service providers, domestic workers, gardeners, um, artisans, you know, electricians and plumbers who work through our platforms. How do we help to try and support them during this time? So one of the things that we responded by doing is putting together a, a fund um, that we had our investors seed. So we put together, it's reached almost 12 million rand now. And we've been supporting, I think for it's it's for over a hundred days, I've been supporting 
um, service providers who aren't able to, to work, who have a reduced capacity to be able to go out and, and work. And then we had to think about the business and business continuity, um, you know, knowing that we were not going to have the same level of income coming into the business. How do we look at cutting costs? And we took quite um, drastic measures again with the, you know with the level of uncertainty the decision was let's let's go hard and cut hard and then we can if we want to kind of dial that back we can do that over time so reducing salaries um, cutting numerous costs speaking to you know landlords to get uh, a reduction or a rebate for for rent um, and then also just thinking about our, our customers and how do we help to be a source of information with all of this uncertainty around um, you know, the virus and how you get it and a lot of uh, disinformation and misinformation. Um, so how do we also make our customers feel comfortable about us being a responsible uh, a company when we are able to resume operations again? Um, but overall, it's been, you know, it's had a huge effect. I, I would say we're probably at about between 50 and 60 percent of, uh, of the volumes that we were doing pre-COVID. And I think that's probably a pretty good situation compared to a lot of businesses at this time. Yeah, it sounds like you had to reinvent yourself uh, during this this period. Um, so Tundo, Asanda, and Nawal, Mike, Paddy, we all see you. Julius, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Connie, hi there. Um, Abu, um, have you also had to do a lot of reinventing? I mean, your line of work is also is, is also about you know interfacing with people uh, physically. That is. So I just wonder, have you had to pivot the way in which uh, you know life check runs? Look, so we definitely have. Um, I mean, uh, the work we do is basically help, helping people plan and navigate big life decisions, mm. finance, career, business, um, and basically building a roadmap to achieving those goals. It's a, a personal finance service, um, you know, tech-based, um, and really about, you know, helping people from a, a kind of an independent perspective, right? So we're not tied to any insurer, any bank, um, and really about kind of focusing on giving people sort of the best advice for their context, right, um, across those areas. So that's, that's what we do. And I think what's been really interesting um, for us is just how much the, like you have to figure out what the core of what you do is um, and how you keep that core intact, but then be quite flexible around the core in terms of how you actually deliver it, right? So that, that, that I think is, is in a nutshell, you know, how we've had to kind of engage. But at the start of the crisis, um, we were extremely fortunate because um, myself and one of my uh, one of our co-founders, so the, the, the four founders uh, in our business, and and one of our co-founders, uh, Shen and I were, we kind of both like you know, uh, a, a numbers people, right? So we, we we sort of always looking at, you know, these sort of things. And, and the one thing you notice that like, like quite quickly is an exponential graph, right? So we could see what was happening with this thing, um, and. And I got into Cape Town, I, th I remember it was, it was a Friday, sort of early-ish March. Um, and, and Shen was, you know, uh, kind of like saying to me that, look, he's actually like, he's quite worried about this thing because it's, it's, it's a very high chance that there's, there's going to be a case, you know, in SA anytime soon. Uh, there's already kind of, you know, well, I think at that point there were already cases. I think there was like a, a handful of cases. But it was like, look, if you actually look at the trajectory, it's, we're, quite, we're probably going to end up, you know, in in like you know the the poo poo is gonna hit the fan, you know potentially sometime in the next few weeks already. Um, and what does it mean? So we actually started looking at this thing, and I think eventually we got to a place where probably about a week before the lockdown, we decided to put the company on kind of like a you know like a, a bit of like let's test out this remote working thing, how would it actually work if this was to happen? Um, and because of what we do, that, that was actually quite an important step to have taken. I think that week head start. Um, made a massive difference because you know we're able to kind of get the logistics sort of out of the way um so we actually i think when when the kind of the soft lockdown was announced we actually went into like a full sort of remote uh, remote uh, uh, work so i remember when the social distancing for about like i think it was like two weeks or a week and we we're actually full remote work already um and really started to engage with clients and started really thinking quite hard about how we're actually going to do you know meetings events you know all things that we do in kind of an online way um and and then quickly then on the back of that then could start to think a little bit more strategically about how do we remain relevant you know at this time right how do we actually give people answers because you know almost in, in a weird way a lot of even though a lot of what we do was impacted the core became a lot more relevant for people right because you know it was a time where like everyone needs more advice 
right? You know, a lot of people, business owners, a lot of people, uh, uh, professionals who are going through very, very difficult, um, you know, uh, circumstances need advice. There's a lot of uncertainty. People need to kind of figure out what, what is going on. People, yeah. there's still a lot of uncertainty. You know, and I think what we were able to do, I mean, one of the things that we're quite proud of was probably within, like I think within three days of lockdown being announced, we actually had a, an, a, a kind of an automated interactive tool that would give you the basics of what you need to do from an advice point of view in terms of, you know, what you need to do with your finances, you know, kind of like just helpful things around if you need to work remotely from work, how to actually set it up, how much, you know, your budget is going to change because um, we're able to kind of act quite quickly on that. Um, and then also just, you know, in terms of the events and the content that we that we focused on. So we, we, we launched a, a, a webinar series um, on, on kind of like how do you actually navigate this COVID-19 situation, I think uh, was, was really timely and very effective. And I think the clients that we actually uh, were able to engage in that time um, became they were incredibly you know grateful for that uh, for that intervention from us. Some things did suffer because we you know you kind of you're trying to do so much new stuff, yeah. right, with the same team, and you have a team that's like highly stretched, and especially our consultants who are kind of like they almost became like first line responders economically, right? So you know just like you know you, you when you've got like a you know a, a scene where people are like really uh, like with it's like a bit of a you know if it's like a bit of a battle scene. The people that are kind of first in the scene, are, they're almost traumatized with what they what they see because it's like it's such a, you can, our consultants were actually like just hearing so many stories of people in really difficult situations uh, suddenly, right? Um, you know, existing clients, new clients, and and it was quite difficult for them. You know, the, the team that you kind of cope with all of that. Um, so it's it's a you know what we do has that you know we're dealing with people, right? Um, and 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 the human impact of the of the crisis. Um, even before we got to, you know, what we're seeing now, uh, just the fear, the uncertainty, the economic disruption, you know, the, the impact on people's livelihoods, um, it was brutal. Um, and it still is. It's, 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 and it's going to continue to be that way for a while. But I think, look, it, we were just grateful that we were able to kind of figure out how to be helpful to our clients um, in, in, in this environment, you know, uh, more, more so, uh, uh, more needed now than ever. It sounds like you were, you know, you were very proactive and you prepared for uh, this new normal, this disruptive normal, I guess. But, you know, I, I wonder, Aisha, for, you know, for businesses such, you know, th that are in the fitness industry, for example, they haven't opened their doors since March, for example. Um, you know, in my neighborhood, um, I walk past, you know, restaurants that were thriving before the lockdown, but have now permanently closed at their doors. You know, how do you even begin uh, to pivot, for example, and, 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 you know, reinvent yourself and readjust, you know, the operating model of your business? I'm Rish, hi there. Can you hear us? Hey, can, well, yeah, I can. Welcome. welcome. So for, every, for people who are joining us, this is Amrish Naranda. He is from uh, Future Growth. As I said, he is a money guy, but don't ask him for money, please, during this webinar. <laughs> Nice uh, we, 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 we tend to think we invest in startups and, and tech and all of that, but we can't even get into a, a webinar. <laughs> but, uh, I think we figured it out. Yeah. You know what? Uh, it happens, Amrish, but thank you so much I think, for joining yeah. it, it, talks to, it talks to the environment we find ourselves in. We've had a plan A, B, and C, and this is a backup laptop that I'm getting onto. It just shows you uh, you've got to have these plans up there, these contingency plans, and, and, and take, take advantage of them. All right, but, well, you, um, we'll get to you in a moment. I mean, there's a lot to get through uh, with you, um, Amrish. But, but yeah, Aisha, uh, you know, for, for businesses that haven't had the opportunity to open their doors uh, since March uh, 27th, I think, that's when uh, the, the official lockdown uh, started. Mm. You know, how do they even begin to, you know, to alter their operating model, for example, to accommodate the new normal? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, Ray, and I think, I think, you know, there are a couple of things that businesses can and, and should try and do. Um, Abu talked about, you know, thinking about what your core is, and you use the example of, um, you know, fitness businesses, for example. Um, one of the things that's, that's really picked up during this time is uh, virtual classes, right? So, you know, you've got a fitness studio. Yes, you can't have classes um, in person, but, you know, um, Zoom yoga, um, you know, Zoom um, high intensity training classes, those things have really picked up. And I think as businesses, what you've got to do is look at what is the core competency of your business. Um, are you able to still do that in other ways? So are you able to still deliver that 
um, in other ways, despite you know not necessarily, for example, having the physical presence or the face to face. Um, you've got to think innovatively. Um, you know the situation calls for it. The situation needs it. It's a. It's you know in many cases a do or die uh, um, a scenario that lots of businesses are in. Um, and and you've got to be agile. And you know Abu talked about responding very quickly when they realized that um, remote work was going to be the reality. Um, you know in our case when we realized that sweep stars, domestic workers, um, home service providers wouldn't be able to work, we had to make some very quick um, technical platform changes to try and allow customers who were canceling to continue contributing to the people who work in their homes, even though they weren't going to work. We literally, I think, you know, took a day or two to make um, system-wide platform changes to allow that. So I think you've got to be able to think on your feet and be agile. And then in some cases, you, you'll need to pivot. You know, there's some cases where you're just not going to be able to roll out um, the service that you provide. So an example of, you know, a different industry and one that we were we were talking about a little bit before we came live is um, the alcohol industry at the moment. And so internationally, what um, businesses who, who supply um, food and beverages are doing is looking at how can they repurpose their manufacturing facilities to provide PPE or disinfectant. So, you know, I think you've got to think outside of the box, look at where, um, firstly, you can operate and where you can, you know, um, kind of uh, take advantage of other trends that are emerging. Um, or if not, how can you pivot your business and look at, you know, core capabilities and how can I use those in ways that help me take advantage of the opportunities that this is presenting. But it is, it's, you know, it's incredibly scary and I don't want to downplay that. Um, you know, as a business, you've often put so much into what it is that you do in their years and years of hard work. And now to think about, um, you know, shifting the way that you do business is, is incredibly scary. And there's a, in many cases, a lot of risk involved. Um, but, you know, again, the time that we're in um, does call for, for those sorts of um, kind of, you know, often high risk or, or, or drastic measures to, to make sure that you can keep on surviving. Yeah. So Regina Valloon says, I've been doing online ballet and gym classes, but after three months, it, it is quite hard to stick it out uh, on mm -hmm. your own. So, so really relaying her own experiences, his or her experiences about uh, the lockdown. But Amrish, uh, cash flows are not no longer the same for many businesses. Uh, how do they even begin to pivot uh, during this time? Oh, Amrish, we're not hearing you. Um, is the hey, just to me? add, just to add, just to add from from where Aisha Aisha's uh, sort of picked up pick up from my Aisha's on. I think part of what we got to uh, accept is uh, COVID's happened, right? And unfortunately, uh, it's easier said than than done. But uh, you know, entrepreneurs' journey of into this path of entrepreneurship, uh, they take a special sort of character, willing to take risks, give up the safety of a secure job. And I think now what we are in is there's uncertainty. There's always uncertainty in entrepreneurship. And it's now that much more enhanced, right? And for instance, I use the analogy of once we leave from Cape Town to get to Johannesburg on the N1, um, there's an accident happening. And we thought we're going on the N1 directly. Now we've got to take a more scenic route and come through via Port Elizabeth, right? And my, my point being is, back to Aisha's point about pivoting, we've got to think, and, and the companies have to be, you got to think off the spot, off, 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 off the cuff. You, you got to be, if I potentially, cash flows is a big thing, without a doubt. If you lock down to zero revenue, I, I can't talk that away. It's, it's a problem. But, you know, if you sort of kicked off and you were willing to sell product A, um, that's no longer relevant given the change in the macroeconomic environment and everything else, then you got to say maybe selling PPE is what I can do. Maybe I can use the same supply chain. Maybe I can use the same sort of... Um, uh, suppliers uh, that have secured product from overseas to, to, to source, you know, a mask for us, you know, and I'm just using that as an example. And not everyone has that ability to, to do it. Um, and I think the smaller sort of enterprises can be a bit more nimble in doing that, um, as opposed to the sort of much more sort of larger corporates, which aren't that, that nimble, you know, and, and I think it is cash flow. We've said this, and I've said this before, um, you've got to take a step back and say, what are, these expenses, you know, nice to have the gun. I mean, you, you know, there's no ways, there's no growth or expansion right now. Um, you know, some, uh, one of the founders of another startup we invested in told me the other day, he's heard this, everyone's going to take pain. 
It's just like how we share that pain. And I think that comes true to say, listen, if it's if you've got a brick and mortar set up, uh, you know, and, and being wary that your landlord himself is taking pain, you know, establish those dialogue. Uh, don't scare and say, well, I'll avoid those calls. No, pick up the call and say, listen, landlord, I have this real problem. You know, this is the inventory I have. We can't sell it because of X, Y, and Z. Start that conversation. So how do we then go? How do we, how do we, uh, can we pay you over three months? Can we pay you over four months or, or, or what that looks like? Similarly with the banks, start the chats with the banks. So all what I'm describing now is to say, how cash is king? How do I preserve cash? How do I get cash back? Now, preserving cash means if there's money in the bank, there has to be money in the bank to some extent. And over and above that, if you've got zero revenue, you have to sort of be able to uh, bring some revenue in. And that's my, my pivot, my Aisha's pivot way. And I think there are many other measures. Uh, if you've got stock, maybe you have to have a discount. Maybe you've got to sell it at 90% of the price just to get the money coming in to roll again. Um, so, so, you know, you've got to think about that and, and each business is different service businesses versus sort of selling goods. Um, but, but I think that gives you some sense of, of, of what we've seen. And yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as cash flow sort of, you know, uh, deteriorates, the, there will naturally be, um, a requirement for funding. And earlier on during this webinar, we asked, we put a poll up about, uh, what's your understanding about venture capital funding about 48% uh, say, I get it and 51% uh, say, please explain it a bit more, but we'll get into that and explaining what venture capital funding is. But Abu, I just want to get a quick bite from you about uh, pivoting. How, how do you even start there? Look, so I think the, look, Aisha's uh, kind of uh, uh, comment and, 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 and I guess the way she responds to the question, I like very much, right? Um, the, the, the I think the, the way that I would probably uh, what I'd add to that is that there's, there's always three dimensions to a crisis, right? So there's there's kind of like the part of the crisis that's purely cyclical, right? Which is the part that is like something is going to go down and then recover, right? And it's just a temporary thing, and that you can just hold your breath and that's fine, right? Th then there's a part of the crisis that is also going to be quite like structural, right? As in things are going to change, and then they're going to go down and they're actually going to stay there, right? So they're not going to recover and go back to where they were. And for structural things, you can't hold your breath, right? Those are fundamentally different things. And if you think of like, you know, large international conferences, right? Um, you know, large international conferences where people are coming, they're flying first class, staying in five-star hotels. You know, I don't know if that's coming back anytime soon, right? Just because, you know, FDs are looking at a slow economy, and the power of video conferencing, they're going to be like, well, maybe we're going to do less than half of what we did last time, right? So I don't know if, if you're in that industry, whether you're holding your breath for it to come back anytime soon. That's a smart idea. So that's, that's probably going to be structural. Then the third component of a crisis are things that we, that we like to call catalytic, right? So things that are going to be empowered and enabled by crisis that weren't being done before, right? So I think, you know, Aisha's comments about, you know, if you are in the fitness industry, the, the question is not only could you serve some of the clients that you're serving uh, in South Africa or in your neighborhood uh, through uh, you know a video, but what about clients in in the UK, clients in Holland, clients in Italy who are locked down just like we are, who before would never have been a possibility for you, right? But actually now you can reach them because the world is now kind of you know globalized in that way, right? So looking at what is the thing that is now possible because of the crisis that isn't possible before, right? So for example. Look, we were only planning to start seeing clients in, in Durban uh, in, in, in the back end of this year, but we're seeing clients in Durban now because it makes no difference whether you live in Claremont, just down the road from me, or whether you're in Durban, right? It's, yeah. it's the same setup, the same infrastructure. So for me, the, it's like looking for one of those things where the, where the, where the crisis has enabled you know, a, a new things that weren't possible before. And I think that component for me is the one that is probably most underestimated, right? The... People make two kinds of errors, right? Either you assume that everything is cyclical, which it's not, because some things are not coming back, right? Or you assume that everything is, you know, entirely bad, right? But there, there's a catalytic component, which is that things, new things are possible uh, because of the crisis, and it's kind of just having a realistic appraisal of all those three components in whatever whatever that you're doing. Like what's 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 changed, and and not coming back the structural stuff. What's just a case of holding your breath? And I think a lot of things to worry about will come back, right? So people, 
ultimately once we've cooped up it long enough we, we're gonna gonna want to go back to our you know our local tourism sites and our and our parks and you know those things will come back right you know we eventually we, we you know we, we, we're not going to be become this like an entire generation of you know homebodies that never leave their house so that that, that, that is going to be structural is cyclical but there's a component of, of stuff that's definitely going to be is structural and then there's like what's catalytic right now i think that's the way that i would look at it yeah i, I don't want to commit you to when things are going to go back to normal I, that's risky i think <laughs> But um, actually, a lot of people want to know what uh, you know venture capital funding is. This is something you have a lot of experience with. It's within your domain. Um, can you maybe just take us through it? Um, you know, what's what makes venture capital funding different from you know normal funding, for example? Well, I mean, so Ray Abu is actually. I mean, uh, not Abu. Abrish is um, is is best positioned to to answer this. But um, just from the point of view of a business that has received venture capital funding, so what it is is, a, is it's a it's a class of investment, um, a, a subsection of, of private equity investment that invests in um, early stage businesses, typically also um, you know smaller from the get go, but high growth businesses. So businesses with high growth potential, it's seen as a a, a riskier. Um, asset class because these are um, relatively newer businesses, but again, because of the high growth, um, is also seen as as an investment class that has much higher returns. Um, often, the types of businesses that are invested in are also innovative. So, um, you know, a lot of VC at the moment is investing into technology businesses. That's not to say that it's only technology businesses. Um, and so, it's not necessarily, for example, every single SMME. Um, that's going to qualify for for VC funding, and of course, it's not the only the only type of funding that's available um, to to small and medium sized and startup businesses. But um, yeah, I mean, Amrish is is obviously a a VC investor and invested in both ourselves and and LifeCheck. Yeah, yeah. I'm heading there, uh, Amrish, because you recently invested. I mean, when I say you, Future Growth, that is Future Growth. Yeah, <laughs> on behalf yeah. of our clients, just so you know, which are pension funds. That's right. Um, you know, Future Growth recently invested in LiveCheck, uh, and also yesterday it was announced that uh, Future Growth is also investing in SweetSouth as well. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder, this environment may not be conducive for investments, so I just wonder yeah. what's pushing Future Growth uh, to back uh, companies during this crisis period? Yeah. So, so future growth. I mean, we we are investment uh, an investment house, right? We're always going to invest in companies, whether there's COVID pre two thousand and eight, after two thousand and eight. We're always looking for opportunities, right? I think, in particular, and I talked to Abu and Aisha, and maybe maybe they can sort of close their ears. But ultimately, you you're backing individuals, right? And in VC, Aisha talks about a very earlier stage business. Well, you know, you don't have much more to go on but an individual and management teams, right? And I think when we took a step back and looked at, at these two businesses, they've got extremely strong management teams with potentially a product um, with, with, which serves a very large addressable market, which we could potentially, as Aisha said, growth. It has to be high growth, right? And we think that, you know, they, 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 they're potentially going to sort of achieve a lot of that growth. Um, and, and hence, hence, sort of the, the the decision to invest. Obviously, there's many other aspects, but 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 that is sort of the key key areas to look at. But just one step behind, we talk VC, and you asked what's VC. Uh, I should describe that spot on. But in terms of the life cycle and journey for an entrepreneur, I think it's important to understand um, an idea is good enough, um, but very few people are going to be able to give you money just at the idea stage. Hey, I'm sitting in my garage. I want to do this. And you hear all these stories about, you know, this is sort of what happened where. But there's a reason why you're sitting in your garage because you didn't have the, fun the funding to be in, in an office. And you've had this brilliant idea, but you worked at it, right? Now, at that stage in the life, it's very early. It's, it's called a sort of, it's a seed stage. The idea is planted and we need to watch it grow. Now, for entrepreneurs at that stage, you know, it's an F and F round, which is called friends and family. That's when you go cap in hand. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Do you even have a thousand rand? Ten thousand rand? Hey, Amrish, do you, would you would give me? Would you give me? Rand? And you bootstrap your idea, but you get it up to a point where you now say, "Listen, you can demonstrate to a funder that this product, call it an app, bringing in, um, you know, 
uh, sweep stars and, and matching them to users. Call it Abus, taking mass education goals, allowing people to reach their goals. This product shows that there's traction. You know, it shows, yes, I've got 500 people, I've signed them up already, and I can go to 1,000. I just need, call it grow capital. Now, there are different funds that play at different parts of that journey. So from friends and family, you'll get to the VC, but the VC is already a bit more, it's a later stage of your startup journey. So they're all risky, they're all sort of extremely early, but it's a later stage. And I think that's important for people to, 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 to realize. And it's also important when you have this idea to think about, you know what, think of that end in mind. Because so often is it, and, and what is that idea? Because the idea is also just as important. And, and I say this all the time, where if there's an idea, if it gets the traction, you should be able to find the funds, right? And more and more, while VC in South Africa is in its infancy in the last sort of 10 year period, there are a lot of capital coming towards um, uh, sort of the space, right? Now, 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 and I think, and I think entrepreneurs need to, to take a step back and say, from the idea, is this scalable? Will I get traction? Will there be legs? And everyone thinks, oh, let me just get 0.5% of the market. No, don't even think about 0.5. You know, get your first customer. You know, Cristiano Ronaldo, if he just says, I'm going to be a good footballer and never kick a football, uh, he's never going to, it never would have worked out, right? So you've got to sort of demonstrate and then, and, 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 and get doing. And, 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 and I, I think the funding should, 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 in most cases, sort itself out. But I think that gives you a summary and a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Amrish football analogies tend to bring it back home. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, Aubrey, let me bring you in here. Um, you know, overseas uh, venture capital funding has, has been criticized for being uh, too prescriptive, meaning that it, it has a bias towards tech-driven companies only. Um, you know, VC uh, venture capital fu uh, funders are also uh, invested for, uh, you know, between five and 10 years, so a very short period and exit. Um, with, an, with an intention to listing a, 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 you know, a company uh, at the end of the day. So there was a question earlier on about what kind of opportunities is VC funding chasing currently during a crisis period? Uh, do you want to have a stab at that? Um, look, so there's also probably a, a question best for Amrish because I'm, I'm mostly thinking about you know, our business and our clients. <laughs> so, um, I, but, but I think what's... Um, what what I'd probably say maybe just before I get to like what is VC doing now is what is like where does VC normally play just from a like the perspective of an entrepreneur looking for funding right so I think first start off that like not all businesses are VC fundable right and 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 not all businesses make sense for VC investment in the sense that look if you know there's some business where you know a lot of capital at the right stage will make a tremendous impact on the outcome over a five to seven year kind of period. Um, and and like usually sooner, right? The five to seven year period are kind of the latest, and those businesses make can make a lot of sense for for for, uh, for VCs. And the reason why it tends to be focused on tech is because normally technology enables businesses kind of you know grow that quickly. But if I give you the example, like let's say you know Walmart, right? I mean Walmart took um, I think something like uh, fifteen to eighteen years to build the first like four or five stores, and then took another 10 years to add the next several hundred, right? And, you know, Sam Walton, when he died, had, big, had built the biggest fortune in the world. Now, Sam Walton's uh, business was not VC fundable. No VC is going to wait, you know, 18 years to get to, you know, uh, to four stores. But by the time that he had built that business um, and he only had four stores, you know, it, it was an unbeatable business, right? Um, and it was a very good investment but not a very good VC investment because of the time horizons involved and the nature at which VC approaches things. I think what is different about uh, uh, future growth and some other investors is that they don't have that kind of like, you know, a, a horizon necessarily, right? So the, the people often talk about VC at the level of like stage, um, as in like when in a company's journey does the does a venture capital investment make sense? It often gets conflated with with style, right, which is what type of company uh, does a, a kind of a, a typical Silicon Valley style venture capital, you know, a kind of a setup makes sense. And because there's so much that is dominated by the tech world um, in terms of how people think about businesses, we often forget that, that the, those two dimensions to VC. 
So, you know, when you talk to, uh, to investors, I think it's really important to understand if there is that fit, right? The kind of business you're building at its core, is it really the kind of business that it makes sense for, it, for, it, for, the, for the person you're talking to across the table, no matter what they call themselves, right? But it, does that business make sense for them to invest in? Because is, is, is the li most likely scenario, if you succeed, that they will also succeed? Because you can succeed and they don't succeed because your success just took too long, right? Or they can succeed and you don't succeed in the sense that, you know, they made a lot of money, but eventually in the process you lost your business, right? Um, so, so it's kind of like, is there a win-win? Right, uh, you know, in, in, in the way that you're engaging the investor. And I think when you bring it to now this crisis and you just overlay the COVID lens on top of it, all that's happened is that COVID has basically changed the shape of the opportunities that, are, that, that, that make sense, right, across those time horizons. So like COVID has accelerated some businesses. And if you go back to the, uh, to the kind of the, the, those three categories of impact that I spoke about, the catalytic uh, businesses, right, the ones that are going to benefit from, from the crisis, are a lot more attractive for VCs, right? Um, because that they, they are now going to, you know, they're, they're already scaling quite quickly, but now they're gonna scale even quicker, right? And I think VCs are looking for those opportunities. Um, Amrish wouldn't mind me saying this, but but uh, v, VCs are, are also being quite opportunistic, right? In in in, in, in how, they, how they're approaching, and I'm not specifically talking about, you know, any particular VCs, but all of them, right? All of them, are, and, and every single one of them are looking at, the ecosystem and, and and licking their lips and saying, well, can we pick up, you know, attractive uh, opportunities at, at at good valuations? Because these these are going to be good businesses, and maybe what's happening is actually quite cyclical. And if we just hold our breath, we'll get through it. But while it's down, can I buy some? You know, you know the, the adage. It's I don't know why finance professionals have these expressions, but the, you know, when there's blood in the street, you buy property. Um, yeah. Yeah. People are kind of adopting that approach. I mean, I, I kind of feel like you know we, we could get away without the bloodshed, but you know this that, that that's, that's the approach, right? That, that I think some of them are adopting. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so I think it's like opportunism and, and things that are catalyzed. But but more important than the COVID crisis, I think you've got to understand is the business that you're in a VC fundable investment to begin with. You know, before you talk about COVID. I think if I can add to that, Ray, it's, it's imperative that that fit Abu talks about is absolutely imperative. Mm -hmm. If And I think what happens is um, as, as entrepreneurs um, and I've obviously uh, before before sort of future girls, also, I'm also an entrepreneur. Uh, you, you, when you're looking for that funding, you go you, you'll go where the funding takes you. Right. And, and ultimately, hey, I got a meeting with so and so. But, you know, the foot's the last thing at that stage. You just need to get that capital to be able to unlock the next stage. But that foot is is, is quite important, um, exceptionally important. And I think, uh, you know, Abu talks about just to to the point about if there's blood in the street sort of by property. I think with, with, with what we're seeing, especially now, with, with it's the opportunism, but it's also it's it's also the ability to it's about risk return, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're coming in now, uh, as you correctly and everyone around this sort of uh, webinar will, will agree, is a crystal ball. Is it is COVID going to be finished at 2022, maybe end of 2021? When's the vaccine coming? As, as, as funders, we sit around the table and we don't know. We don't know. So we've got a price for that risk, you know what I mean? And, and unfortunately, in pricing for that risk and expecting a higher return, given the risk, you end up you know, you don't want to own. I, the last thing we want to do is, is run live check and run run sweeps out. That's not our style. Um, but but it's unfortunately in in, in this sort of environment uh, that that does sort of happen. Yeah, I, I wanted to say um, earlier on that I hope that you know we won't call venture capital vulture capital in the next few uh, weeks or so. Uh, but actually, let me bring you in here. Um, you know, you know. The risk return uh, expectations of investors, you know, during a crisis period, should they be moderating the expectations, uh, you know, venture capital funders, for example, um, and should they funding, you know, be, be allocated to, you know, businesses that address the broader social issues, such as employment, for example, we know that unemployment is a big issue right now. So, so does the COVID-19 crisis push uh, you know, uh, venture capital funders to moderate their expectations when it comes to returns. Um, so, Ray, I think I think one of the things that we have to kind of keep in mind is the fact that uh, venture capital funds also have investors into those funds. 
Um, you know, and funds are set up with the purpose of making a return on investment for whoever the LPs are who invest into those funds and then give those funds the mandates to invest in other companies. Um, that said, you know, my view has always been that it's good business to invest in businesses that have positive social impact. Um, and I think regardless of um, COVID, I think um, that's something that is that I've certainly seen has become um, increasingly important to the best types of uh, funders across the board, whatever you know type of investments they do. Um, asking, you know, is there a positive social impact to what this company does? And I think they're looking at it through the lens of sustainability. So, you know, if you're doing bad business, if there's a, a negative, a net negative effect to your business being around, there's a higher chance that you know, uh, customers are going to come back and, you know, and, and, and not want to use your business. Um, you know, the your employers, your employees, whoever it is, you know, are, are not going to, you know, they're going to revolt against the business or whatever it is. So, so I think it actually is just good business in general um, to, to, to take into account positive social impact. Um, that said, I think there are a couple of trends that are happening kind of in line with the pandemic that are also um, kind of encouraging this view to look at um, positive uh, social, environmental um, impact of businesses. So, um, you know, looking at movements like, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and then the resulting kind of focus on diversity. Um, those sorts of, um, and they're not trends, those sorts of movements are causing uh, a lot of people to think about who they associate with. Um, you know, what kind of practices are, are sustainable um, in, in a good way and long term. Um, so, so I think, yeah, I think there's some trends that are happening alongside COVID that are pushing that along. Um, I think COVID itself probably has, has some impact on that. Um, but I think, you know, I'm looking forward to a time when it just becomes a no brainer um, for, you know, what is the impact of this business to be a core part of um, the decision making from a, a VC or any sort of funder around whether to invest or not. And I know certainly with future growth and their investment into us, that was a very big feature of the due diligence was, you know, this platform exists. It's helping people find employment opportunities. That's great. You know, big tick box, unemployed people are getting employment. But in what other ways are you positively contributing to people's lives? And how are you helping to uplift and upskill people um, post them just getting work? So I think yeah. the best the best types of uh, uh, investors are already doing that. So, yeah. so, so, Ray, can I just jump on you? I have to. Um, I should say more and more. Uh, I think I'd just like to go on to record. Future Growth's been doing this for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years in terms of socially responsible investments, right? Uh, well before it became fashionable. Let me just say that, right? And for us, it's more, and we've been able to demonstrate that not only is it okay, because back to Aisha's point, you know, there's funders behind that. You know, Mary or Luke's grandmother who's going to retire of grandfather is, is going to need some so, some sort of return to their pension, right? So we can't obviously, we've got to take the right risk for it and be able to, to, to deliver on those promises. But what we've demonstrated is a double R. We can have responsible returns. And, and we've been doing it. And, and I think more and more we're seeing, and if you do that right and tick those boxes, you know, you create a way more sustainable investment, um, yeah. which, which is spot on to, to what Aisha is saying. Yeah, maybe we need some form of, you know, reform in the pension fund uh, industry and how capital is allocated, but I'm not picking up that fight. Um, it's, it's a big fight already. But let's go to questions. We have about 17 minutes left for questions. Uh, Mike Schultz asks, uh, besides listing an entity, uh, what are the opportunities for extracting a capital from a business uh, a VC company has invested in? Um, Abu, do you want to take that, maybe? Um, look, so I think the, the, the many opportunities, right? So, so obviously, they could sell to someone else, right? Uh, who's 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 coming in, um, and and who maybe has a different horizon. So you can't have a company invest now. You know, you're not quite at the point where you where you listed or you or, or you're being in, entirely sold or or that you're even paying dividends, and they could sell to someone else that's kind of coming in at that point. I think that's 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 called secondary sales. That's a lot of ways in which you know sort of early stage investors you know get their return. Um, and then, of course, the company might actually, you know, uh, believe it or not, turn a profit, right, and 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 start to say, start to pay a dividend toward uh, uh, to investors, and 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 they might get something out of it out of it that way. 
Um, but but look, generally, generally, I think on that one, a lot of the time, I guess VCs uh, and investors have to take a view on what's the ultimate exit because if the company is growing as fast as everyone hopes, you know, there shouldn't be a good reason to give the money back to investors. They should be reinvesting that into the into the business and growing as quickly as as possible and asking for more money to actually grow faster. So generally, it's like it's either secondary or you or you get to a point where the company actually becomes acquired, and that happens, you know, quite a lot more often than listings, right? So where you know the company gets acquired by someone else who you know for them this business plus theirs makes a lot of sense together and and they then kind of you know uh, they're willing to pay more than you know what the company might be worth in the hands of someone else because you know they can do something with it that the other person can't so yeah. that becomes you know a, a a a good exit round as well um yeah i think that the listing the ipo sort of sure. purely technical right there's actually a, a strategic sale and there's a financial sale. A financial sale will be like to someone like Future Growth, a fund. We literally provide money and, and back jockeys. A strategic sale is probably um, Abu selling to one of the big insurers or Abu selling to another private wealth company that's listed in the U.S. Not, not that it's ever going to happen. I'm just saying it, it's mm. an example. Now, mm. over the research, uh, strategic sales, you end up requiring, uh, end up, um, it's proven that the exit is more lucrative. Uh, for entrepreneurs more so than financial. It just depends. Uh, that's what the numbers say. And the IPO, uh, you know, initial public offering. So those are the three sort of ways to go. But I think just on that point, you know, it, this doesn't happen, you know, obviously future growth, we long-term investors, as Abu said. We come in here, if Aisha grows this and Abu grows this, we'll still be here 10 years down the line. We back jockeys, right? Now, we're not here to say, hey, let's sell this thing in two years time. And that's the difference with future growth. We patient capital. And that's an important, very important point, right? I think um, to the extent that the returns are coming, right? You can't be patient and then the business is not growing because then your returns are not sort of coming through. But to the extent that's, that that's happening, you're extremely patient. And I think what's important is um, in terms in terms of that uh, that, that exit, um, you know, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's those options. But entrepreneurs need to think about that on the onset as well. So often than not, people just start businesses and not think about where's that exit one day. Because, you know, if it's family owned businesses, for instance, hey, no, don't worry, Amrish will join the business later on. Uh, and then Amrish's kids will join the business. But no one's actually thought about maybe Amrish wants to go into corporate or not. So let's build these businesses up with thinking what is that exit? It always helps because it changes the way you actually go out and, and realizing that journey. Yeah. Uh, Camilla Gilman asks, uh, do you think there are opportunities for VC, venture capital, in the local manufacturing industry, uh, specifically clothing and textiles? Anyone wants to take that? I'm happy to give it a step. I think <laughs> it, there's always opportunities. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say two things and I'll let, I'll get, let Aisha and Abu say something to it. But listen, yeah. there, there's always going to be opportunity. Again, what, what does it mean? If it means I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, so am I selling to Mr. Price? Do I have that offtake? Um, you know, am I selling it to sell to other? If you, if you have that offtake, if you can demonstrate you have that offtake, you know, funding should be available. Are you setting up a manufacturing plant with 10, 10 seamstress or is it 20? You know, start small and, and, and you know, again, uh, it's about, about, about mitigating your risk. Uh, but I, I don't see why there shouldn't be uh, that opportunity. Aisha Nabu? Aisha? <laughs> opportunity in manufacturing textiles? I mean, I, yeah, I can only really echo what, what Amish just said. I mean, um, I think, again, it, it really depends on the specific business, business idea. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some, some industries can be more difficult for various reasons um to to invest in when you're a high growth investor but uh, but again you know i think and and looking at technology um i think when you're able to you know bring technology uh to a business idea or solution um in a space that hasn't really been um kind of positively influenced as an industry by by technology and i don't mean manufacturing technology i mean technology as an in information technology so um you know online stores that sort of thing um then i think there's there's always opportunity um and what i think people should should really focus on is you know what is the industry that you um amrish talked a lot about jockeys and backing jockeys you know so as a as a jockey as a business owner as an entrepreneur what is what is an industry that you understand really well and then how can you leverage 
some of the advantages of um, you know technology of more open networks etc to to try and um, unearth uh, you know new new opportunities within that industry yeah yeah because I mean we, we, we literally have 10 minutes I want to get to uh, Asanda Barmaza's question I think it's 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 about how inclusive the, the venture capital industry is. Uh, he or she asks, I'm not sure if this will come out right, but does or will the VC environment look at funders from the townships? Or, or I think targeting township-based uh, you know, businesses. Um, Abu? Um, so I think what they're asking is, so I'm happy to take this one, because I think, I think what they're asking is basically, um, in other words, could VCs raise money from stock files? Right, effectively is what they're asking, and 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 I think the 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 answer to that question just from a because this is what we actually do we help people with, you know, a, a advice on 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 questions like this. Um, the answer to that question is probably not right, and it, it's probably not a good idea. So look, if you when it, when it comes to think about how you invest, right, and I think this is for you know everyone in in their personal capacities, you you got to be quite focused on what your goals are. Right. So what is that money actually meant to do for you? What job is it meant to do for you? Is that money meant to, you know, uh, uh, help you get, get your business off the ground? Is it meant to be, you know, savings for a rainy day? Uh, is it meant to be savings for your kids' education? Is it for when you get older? What is that money for? And, and that, that goal normally has a time horizon to it. Right. So, you know, if you if you are investing in a stock full, it could be because you want to take a holiday whenever it is that you can take a holiday when COVID is is, is behind us. Um, or it's because you want to, it's a stock fall that's aimed at, you know, um, you know, building something in the community or it's, or it's aimed at something else. Now, that goal has a horizon, right? And I remember we said that VCs have, you know, at least kind of like a five to seven year horizon. And the thing about, the thing about uh, uh, these funds is that they, you know, the money is locked up, right? So it's not like if there's an emergency, you can kind of, you know, if you invested in a VC fund um, that you can kind of phone up. Uh, you know, someone be like, you know, can I can I just you know, withdraw some money quickly because you know I, I I need to pay for an emergency. The kids the kids' school fees is is due, and I'm I'm a little bit tight on cash. It doesn't work that way, right? So VC VC investing is a highly highly specialized and sophisticated asset class, um, that that you know is 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 for uh, people that are in a position to be able to, a, be able to take that risk and be be able to wait, right? You know, uh, long enough to actually be able to get that return. And, and you know, so we, for example, wouldn't wouldn't advise clients to actually invest in VC for the ordinary person um, that that doesn't have, you know, if you don't have, let's say, you know, a five million and above of free investable money that you can commit, I'd probably say rather focus on investing in, you know, getting getting advice uh, uh, on on things that that makes sense for you, and I would strongly encourage you to get the advice from LifeCheck because you want independent advice uh, on, on these things. <laughs> Nice plug-in there, Abu. Nice plug-in. <laughs> but Amrish, I want to get to you because a lot of people are asking uh, a lot of, you know, very practical questions. Um, you know, how does an entrepreneur ready themselves to attract uh, a potential VC funder? Um, where do I even begin to go to, to seek information, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, venture capital uh, funders? But, but how, how do, you know, entrepreneurs ready themselves for this next phase of funding? You mute um, Amrish. Apologies for that rookie mistake. Uh, I'm I'm gonna go, um, uh, and then I'm gonna definitely hand over to Aisha and Abu because you gotta hear it directly from the horse's mouth. I think I think with regards to what are we looking for, right? Uh, you, you you get into a business, uh, you you grow it, um, you, and and this is a, one of our other investments that uh, we've we've made is in a company called Yoko. Everyone should know Yoko. They a payment sort of point of sale device business where they provide solutions to you know entrepreneurs. And why we like them is one of the aspects is you know it's more than just recording your sales on an Excel spreadsheet somewhere and in the back of a black book, right? Because you need financial reporting, you need annual financial statements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to be able to raise capital, you know. So, so part of it is reading your business from the onset that should I bring an external party in, I will have to be able to quite clearly demonstrate that these are the sales I did. This is what my cost of sales is. This is what my income is. This is my assets on it. Do you know what I mean? And to the extent that will then feed into what the first normal step is, is a pitch deck. You get a pitch deck and, and the innocent, and I'm not even going to go into that detail because that will be a webinar on its own. But a pitch deck is, you know, 
four, no, in 10 to 15 slides telling you about the business, the solution, the problem you're solving, a bit, you know, to, you know um, a bit of the accounting side of your business. And that's sort of being sent off to entrepreneurs, which uh, venture capitalists, which you obviously get through networks, attending life check events where you sort of meet individuals who you may think will potentially be, uh, you know, uh, uh, invest in your business. And thereafter, to that is an in-depth building of a financial model, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what's important is there's a lot of information online. You just got to know where to find it to be able to, to assist. There's no reason why without anyone without access with access to the internet shouldn't be able to put a good pitch deck together, build a good financial model, uh, before even getting a chartered accountant or you know, a finance guy into it, you, you can do it. And I think, you know, Aisha, Abu, do you want to just elaborate into those steps? Yeah. Aisha, how did you do it? How did you attract a VC funding? Uh, people want to know. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it quite brief because I know we are, um, we, we don't have a lot of time, but, but um, the way that we, we first got funding, so, so Sweep South was bootstrapped for the first, uh, about a year and a half from, I Idea to uh, launching six months later, and then we closed the our first funding round. And it was an angel round of funding uh, about nine months after that, just over nine months. Um, and the way that we got funding was we um, went to a, a startup conference and and pitched our idea. At that point, we were when we pitched. I think about five months in, so we'd launched the business. Um, you know, the things there being important for those very early stage investors. And again, this is not VC funding. This is very early. So this is seed stage. We didn't do a friends and family round. We, we sold um, all of our own belongings. So sold our house, car, um, everything in the house and used that to fund the business pension fund savings. Um, so um, we went to a, a, a conference, a pitched at a pitching conference, wanted to just get some customers out of the audience at the pitching conference. And a guy called Vinnie Lingham was one of the judges um, of the pitches, and he ended up investing in the business. I saw one of the questions um, was whether Vinnie's still an investor. He's exited our business and made a, I think it's about a net 10x return. Um, he, he exited a few years ago, so he'd invested, I think it was two or three years um, made about a, a 10x return. He'd invested in uh, seed stage, and then I think invested in uh, in the in the next stage of investment as well. And is now using that to invest in in other businesses, which I think you know is is incredibly important. Um, and um, I think some of the things that he was looking for is exactly as Amrish said, like the team. You know, is this a, a solid team? Is it a team that can actually execute on this business idea? Is there some traction at least so that I can see that they can execute on this, even if it's just early stage traction? Um, and then what's the, the the potential of this idea? So what, you know, is there a, a big market size? Um, if these guys, you know, continue growing and they do well in this market, is it a big enough market to see the sorts of returns that you would expect from, um, you know, angel VC uh, investors? Um, and there are many, many ways to get your first investor on board. Reach out to, and, and this is something that you have to put away when you become an entrepreneur. No is, it must happen to you. It will happen to you many, many times. Don't be afraid of hearing no. So, you know, for our, our subsequent stage of investment, we literally reached out to over 100 investors, cold calling, cold emailing. Um, so put yourself out there, introduce yourself to people, don't be afraid of hearing no. No should come with advice and that helps you strengthen your pitch and strengthen your business. Um, but you honestly have to try absolutely everything. Good companies uh, get turned down a lot. So, you know, you've got to be prepared for a little bit of rejection and that's fine. Yeah. Abu, you have the final bite. How did you do it? Um, how would you implore others to do it as well? I think the most important thing is that you have to build a business that has traction. Right, uh, just do everyone pull out the one thing that that everyone is, is is kind of touched on a little bit. I think you have to, and 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 then I, what I'd add to that is that you shouldn't you shouldn't have a goal. If if your goal is to attract VC investing, then you've got the wrong goal, right? Your goal should be to build a successful business, and then VC investing may be a way to to get that. So so don't start off by saying how do I attract VC investment. Start off by saying how am I going to build this business and what do I need to get there, and how do I get the early things right to show that. I'm solving real problems for customers, right? So if you, if you if you want to focus on one thing, it's like what problem am I solving for my customers that they cannot solve without me today, and and just be obsessed about that. The rest you can build on.
Well, unfortunately, we, you know, the, you know, uh, it's already 1 p.m. and we have to leave it there. Um, Amrish uh, Narandes from Future Growth, Asha Pando from Sweet South, and Abu Adaya from um, Life Check. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Keep safe, keep warm, and take care.